hundred percent. That chemotherapy, you know, we need to. How do we need to spread for that chemotherapy? What's the big thing we need to know to make the right choice? Um, for performance or something. Like that. So the performance status, you mentioned on the NCC and guidelines, is very important. What else? Go back to question number two and number three. So the non-squamous versus squamous, mm -hmm. that's what we need to know. We need to know if they're squamous to know if we need to avoid or if we need to know if they're non-squamous. Like, what, what do we need to do in reference to their treatment? Because if they're non-squamous, we're going to do one thing. We're going to include one agent. Mm -hmm. And if they're and if they're squamous, we're going to we're going to do a totally different thing. Mm -hmm. so we need to know if they're if they're large cell. Or adenocarcinoma versus being squamous cell. That's how we're going to choose the correct chemotherapy regimen if y'all opt for the chemotherapy on the patient. So every patient I ask you about, I'm going to know that they're either adenocarcinoma or large cell or squamous. That's going to immediately cause you to want to take a pick a double to make it has cisplatin with taxotere or dose of taxol, has cisplatin with gemcitabine versus has cisplatin with pimetrexin. Does everybody understand that? Mm -hmm. Okay. So going to immunotherapy. Immunotherapy and targeted therapy are really focused on things like pembrolizumab, tezolizumab, or dermalizumab. So dermalizumab, what is it, what's special about it? What is it using? What kind of patient is you using it? And what is the combination that you have with dermalizumab is special? Small. It's an unresectable stage of infection. And then not only getting your balloon out, we're actually getting radiation to get your balloon out and chemotherapy. That's what's special about it. Typically, what you get is you get chemotherapy with immunotherapy, like a pembrolizumab or tesalizumab, which is what we'll talk about when we go to small cell. But understand the utility of your balloon now. Uh, target therapy, what is target therapy? Like, give me an example of some target therapy. We talked about some target therapy this morning. EGFR directed tyrosine kinase inhibitors considered targeted therapy. So, what's an EGFR mutated tyrosine kinase inhibitor? Oh, early. Oh, early. Mm -hmm. Okay. What's a KRAS inhibitor? What's a mutated KRAS inhibitor? Okay. What's a KRAS inhibitor? It's a torch. Remember that's Lumacrax. That's a, that targets mutated KRAS. Mm -hmm. Okay, all of that's targeted therapy. Mm -hmm. The only one of those that we talked about that's not targeted therapy is actually the ones that are targeted PDL1. So that's what the that's the that's the immunotherapy. Mm -hmm. Everything else that's mentioned in our list, we're talking about all of our, our abnormalities, those are all targeted therapy. Carboxantin is a is targeted therapy, bimorapamid with trametinib, mm -hmm. or uh the rapamid with trametinib and uh, bimorapamid, that's those are all targeted therapy. Uh, the certain the ceterinib, as well as the uh, prazotinib, the targeted therapy, okay, looking at AOK, as well as ROS1 rearrangement, so all of the targeted therapy. The, the adotrestuzumab, uh, the tansin, with the, and also the famotrestuzumab, uh, gerontitecan, that's all targeted therapy. So understand the difference between the two. So, the small cell, so you see the vast majority, one, one through 22 is gonna come from, from non-small cell. Okay, it's, it's, it's number one is the most common type, but it's a lot of medication that you can really get into with those. And notice I'm, I put on here toxicity. Why I put on here toxicity? Because that hydration I was talking about with the cisplatin, that chemotherapy do not give all the medication I expect you guys to have with any patient that's on cisplatin, or part of those high doses of carboplatin like you saw, that's fair game. So understand the four or the three drug regimen, which one is appropriate. Right. So if we don't have cisplatin, we don't need that other regimen? Like no, carboplatin and the AUC of six, which is what the replacement for the cisplatin will be if the patient has uh, compromised renal function, is still uh, considered highly medicated. What if we don't need any of those drugs? Then no. Yeah, like for instance, immunotherapy alone, mm -hmm. or osimertinib, yeah. or um, carboxanthinib, mm -hmm. no. Yeah, this, is just a, this is just a chemotherapy containing regimen that was flat. Mm -hmm. Carboplatin ABC of six, or a 
patients with the cisplatin uh, at the dose, whether it's the lower dose or the higher dose, 75 milligrams. So if you were to use the other ones like Pembro, yep. what would be the support care for that? Actually, we can get a Pembro by itself. It doesn't even require uh, any, uh, it doesn't require any pre-medication. It doesn't require any hydration. If you are just giving the, uh, the monoclonal antibody immunotherapy by itself, it doesn't require it. The only time, uh, all of the monoclonal antibodies that you see in lung cancer is now being used are, are either fully human, they're pretty much fully human. Mm -hmm. There's a few of them that are humanized. So pembrolizumab is a humanized monoclonal antibody. Okay, but uh, intensolizumab is technically a, a fully human, so you have some that are fully human. Okay. <coughs> All right. So histology of small cell, what, what, how do we, how do we uh, identify small cells? Small blue epithelial cells. Small blue epithelial cells. All right, so in addition to small blue epithelial cells, prognosis. How is the prognosis of small cell when you compare it to non small cell? It's not good. It's not too it's So it accounts for about 14% of the cases, but 25% of the deaths. So a quarter of the deaths associated with lung cancer are small cell, but only 14% of the cases. So it's much more. Cause much more mortality and morbidity when you compare it to. Now, back again to toxicity uh, and treatment. So, with our treatments here, what are our options? Like, what do we typically do with these? We have cisplatin or carboplatin with what? With two other things. Etoposide and radiation. So, remember, in limited stage, there should be radiation and chemotherapy. It's going to be a platinum-based chemotherapy doublet, whether it's carboplatin or cisplatin. So, uh, so if it's got car if it's got carboplatin or cisplatin, what do we just say about supportive care? What's needed? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Chemotherapy just now the volume medication. What if you try to use carboplatin as opposed to cisplatin? Do you still need hydration? Yeah. No. 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 Carboplatin does not require hydration. Cisplatin requires hydration. Cisplatin does not require hydration. Even if you have a high dose of it, cisplatin requires pre and post hydration. And the pre and post hydration, what does it need to contain? That's magnesium and potassium. So the pre hydration contains magnesium and potassium. Surgery is required for anybody who's resectable that's below stage three. So that's the, that's actually why surgery is there under so that number twenty-five. Surgery is required for stage one. Then is the stage one that they have to try to put it on the limited So stage one means they don't have any lymph nodes that are positive, and the tumor is actually limited to a small area. So a very small tumor and no lymph nodes that are positive, which is not a frequent occurrence as far as when you can diagnose a patient with small cell, but if that isolated occurrence, if you saw that, you possibly could do surgery. And that's, the, that's why the like, majority of patients are being diagnosed in stage two and stage three, which all of those are considered limited stage, and chemo radiation is the, is the primary therapy. Acerbate is not required for any Correct, yeah. The only, even, you'll have a patient in stage two limited, and surgery won't be on the table. You'll be getting chemotherapy and radiation. Questions about that? Okay, the last thing. So, another part that was on there. So, I said the chemo and radiation, 
and one other piece was radiation. And it's specifically cranial radiation is prophylactic. And that's because the small molecule, the small cell lung cancer, uh, has a high risk of spreading to the brain. So it's indicated for the patient to get a PCI, prophylactic cranial radiation. The only, the only reason I bring this up is because I want you guys to know the utility of the intestinal valve. So the intestinal valve uh, in the extensive stage, essentially like the preferred regimen is to contain the intestinal valve. You have the preferred regimen there too, but the intestinal valve is a lot of times what you'll see. You, you guys are familiar with durable, but I don't think we've had much intestinal valve conversation. A little bit of maintenance up there in our small cell, but in the extensive stage, it's a category one recommendation. So that first regimen there, looking at the intestinal valve at 1200, with the carboplatin and your total side is going to be like a go-to regimen. The reason why you like carboplatin, uh, well, let me not tell you. What, why do you think you like carboplatin in this patient population? When I say somebody's extensive, what does that mean? Extensive stage. It means it's metastasized, and that means that we can't cure them. So when you have patients metastasized and you can't cure them, you typically want to do a regimen that has better tolerability so you can treat them longer with it. If you give them a regimen that's hard to tolerate and the patient can't stay on therapy, then you pretty much put give them a you give them a medication that they're gonna for one reason or the other stop taking because they can't tolerate and then that's gonna cause them to lose their life faster. So you want them to be able to have a regimen that they can tolerate for long periods of time or as long as possible, because that's gonna lead to them living longer. That's why carboplatin. You notice all of the first three preferred regimens are carboplatin containing regimens for the immunotherapy, which is better tolerated in the extensive stage. And just like that, 31 questions. <laughs> Uh, 
uh, in place of chemotherapy or following chemotherapy? So you said the regimen of like the preferred spamus or it doesn't matter like what target like the markers, it doesn't matter about the markers? Yeah, they can tolerate these. Like if there's no if there's no medical reason or clinical reason why they, they have non squamous let's say a large cell mm -hmm. and you should be coming there at the gate and like, okay, I think I need to use this plan with penetration. Mm -hmm. Unless there's some like unless I feel then that the patient is got a performance status of three. Very, they're not they're not moving around well, they're not very healthy. The chemotherapy alone will kill them. So then you start to have a conversation about, oh, let's check their PD PD level one status, let's check their EDFR, let's do all the molecular markers, because we might have to give them a less pronounced therapy. Mm. So one should never just go in trying to like give them medication that targets whatever that's positive. You should just automatically not, not in the adjuvant city. Adjuvant neoadjuvant setting, chemotherapy, systemic chemotherapy is still at the top of the list. Okay. Now, when you get to the metastatic setting, all of those agents are approved in the metastatic setting. So that really, really long list of all of those agents, mm -hmm. as you can see, this is the adjuvant therapy you should use. There's only one of those 30 agents that's on the adjuvant list of therapies. Now, all of them are on the metastatic list. So you do the molecular testing, and then if they're metastatic, you have all of these options of what you can use. Can you use that and still use uh, some of the target therapy? You mean, also, you mean like at the same time? Mm -hmm. No, like so the data, the data, you have to use them, you can use them sequentially, but not concurrently. Yeah, not concurrently, like sequentially. Sequentially, you can use it. Yeah, if they, if they fail one, they have another yeah. mutation, you can use it there. Oh. Yeah. So, so you can't do, like, you're going to use the other one unless the first one fails. Right, so they said they got the EGFR positive mutation. Mm -hmm. So now you got Erlodinib mm -hmm. uh, and you got Osimernib. Mm -hmm. Now, let's say uh, Osimernib brand is Tegresso. So let's say Tegresso, they, they progress after about 12 months. Mm -hmm. But they also had like the, the red um, rearrangement. So mm -hmm. now Carbozantinib can be mm -hmm. followed up after Tegresso. Okay. So we can do the original response. You only use that for like after you did the chemo and it's still something then then that's what you're going to target. That's what you're saying. So that is for the oral when it metastasized. So the original is that. Okay, so so uh, in, in the in scenario where we had a patient, uh, they had core compression. Typically, we wouldn't be doing the chemotherapy on because we try to stabilize the core compression. So the high dose steroids will trump whatever we could do with the with the chemotherapy that's not been positive. Once we stabilize it, then we can give it another dose of chemotherapy, and then we can give you three or four drug Yes, ma'am. Oh, he, he's asking about a combination, a situation where a patient. Trying to get chemotherapy, but they have a core compression, and I'm and I'm kind of talking to you guys about using steroids and CIMB treatment, and I'm telling you to get to for the core compression treatment, and I'm telling them that in that situation, the oncological emergency trumps the chemotherapy. We hold the chemotherapy, and we give the patient the steroids, maybe radiation to their back uh, to try to uh, stabilize them before we would, uh, proceed with chemotherapy. So you said for the carboplatin is AUC times the EGFR. AUC times the creatine clearance uh, oh, plus twenty five. Yeah, so the EGFR is different than the creatine clearance. Oh. The creatine clearance is produced by Crocodile. The EGFR is actually a um, a computerized uh, electronic um, estimation. So it's always different.
respect to Sikha de Maya. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Oh no, we gotta calculate the current exam ourselves. That's what we're gonna do. Wait, we need. We're gonna make us do it ourselves. He said before. He said before, yeah. We ain't finna. Oh, yeah, I have your question. Will you be correct? Will you be correct? I see y'all. 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 I see y'